So, hello everybody. Welcome to this uh, Sven uh, Index uh, International Seminar. I am Claude Duval. I uh, work at EDF Direction Industrielle and I'm happy to share this uh, session with Jean. Yes, Jean Ders, uh, good afternoon. I am co-chairing the, the session with, with Claude. I am from Framatom in charge of uh, innovation, research and development. So uh, now I I'm going to say a few words about what we are going to do this afternoon. I will share a little uh, screen now. Um, so uh, this uh, this afternoon, the session this afternoon is part of a series of uh, seminars uh, uh, belonging to uh, index uh, Congress uh, web series of webinars. So this is the seventh in the series. And um, what we are going to do this afternoon, we have uh, uh, five uh, topics to, pre to be presented uh, to you this afternoon according to what is on the screen now. And first, first of all, uh, Monsieur Leporte will speak about machine, machining simulator. And then Mr. Wachi will speak about reinforced concrete structures and 3D modeling. And then um, Mr. Dot and colleagues will uh, speak about BIM innovation for civil works detailing according to a inclepency uh, project and then Karina Lopez and his colleague will speak about open beam for the new build so the nuclear new build and finally uh, Mr. Bancarel and colleague will uh, say a few words about uh, what is going to be uh, studied for uh, EPR2 construction. I have uh, two advices for the participant to this seminar so if you use Teams you have a, a specific facility with the S, the Slido function in your team session, probably. And if you activate this uh, facility, you can uh, interact with the speaker. You can ask questions and we will uh, um, uh, we will um, uh, present oh, wow. the question to the speakers. And then another, another information, this session is being recorded uh, and uh, it will be uh, uh, put on YouTube so that uh, after the session everybody can, can go back and uh, reuse the, the video for, for um, any concern. And um, before I let the floor to the first presentation, I thank uh, very much all my colleagues for having submitted this uh, presentation to the Index Congress. Uh, you have numerous speakers um, well motivated this afternoon and I'm very happy to share the, the session with them and also to share the room with, with part of them this afternoon. So if uh, Mr. Leporcher is ready to open his conference, is the um, topic um, I let Sorry, Claude, we, we lost uh, Emil. He's disconnected. So sorry, we can sorry. Go I, can, to the next I, can, I can make a small introduction for Emil. Um, yes, but maybe, Jean, we wait for the for Mr. Leporcher very well connected. Yeah, right. for the moment, it's not here. So maybe we can move forward into the program. Okay, thank you. So maybe Jean, you can introduce the presentation from Mr. Wachi. Yes. So uh, thank you, thank you, Claude. So the the second speaker, which is now the first speaker, uh, is uh, Wachi uh, Gianluca. Uh, Gianluca uh, has a PhD in uh, structural engineering, and three years after his uh, PhD, he joined the Aegis Group as a structural engineer and now he is in charge of the civil engineering of EPR project, so in the heart of the nuclear reactor field. Uh, his presentation will give a methodology uh, through modeling of uh, assessment of uh, the margin in the design of concrete structure. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. Hello, everybody. I'll try to share my presentation. Hope it works. So um, today I'm very pleased to give you my presentation on the assessment of reinforcement margin in the design of a reinforced concrete structure and show you a tool we developed at AGIS for the digital assessment of reinforcement margin based on 3D model reinforcement. First, please let me introduce you AGIS, uh, which is uh, a consulting and construction engineering firm founded in France and operating all around the world. Aegis is a major player in the nuclear new build civil engineering, providing his expertise in uh, 
uh, over 70 years of, uh, of work in, uh, in Europe and uh, abroad. We work side by side with clients, uh, offering our experience uh, in uh, third and fourth uh, uh, generation reactors, fusion reactors, SMR and civil and military uh, nuclear facilities. At AGIS, we developed a multidisciplinary approach which allows to manage complex projects. And we are, uh, as architect engineer, committed to the new nuclear, where digital engineering, BEAM and PML are used to achieve the highest uh, standard of quality and safety. So in the next slide, I will present to you the stake of reinforcement margin assessment. I will uh, make a summary of the main steps of civil work structural design process, and we'll focus on how its digitalization can improve the management of changes on the part of construction. I will then introduce you the digital margin assessment and present how the, the work, the, the tool we developed works. And we conclude by presenting uh, the improvement and the benefits achieved with this tool and uh, uh, present some perspective for final uh, for future works and application of this tool. So first of all, uh, why we are interested in, in reinforcement margin assessment and uh, what is so important for the construction of nuclear power plants. First of all, we have to keep in mind that uh, changes uh, on uh, on construction sites are, is normal business. So we have to deal with it. And uh, this is particularly important for the reinforcement uh, concrete structure because of the reinforcement optimization that is a key requirement for time saving and cost effective projects. Uh, when a change occurs on site, it may have a, uh, in some case, large impact on the structure. So we need to uh, assess the reinforcement margin to make sure that the change is feasible and it is safe. It is very important for reinforced concrete structure because uh, by reducing, uh, by optimizing the reinforcement, this needs to be assessed because there is uh, almost no room for uh, for margin and uh, any change has to be carefully assessed in order to allow the project management to take the decision about the changes that has to be introduced. Here I show you how the digital work structural design process has become more and more digital. Digital data are uh, exchanged between different stakeholders from architect sketch up to the fabrication of the reinforcement and the construction on site. The civil work uh, designer models the structure and uh, its environment by means of finite element model and design the reinforcement. For each finite element, the required reinforcement is calculated and the practical reinforcement is generated by defining the spacing and the diameter of the rebars. This is the input data for the civil war, uh, for the civil uh, works detailer that produce a 3D model of the reinforcement by modeling each bar that needs to be installed inside. Those models are declashed, means that the rebars are the conflicts between the rebars are solved uh, before the model is handed over to the civil works contractor for the reinforcement fabrication and the installation. It is on site that most of the change occurs. This is are due to several reasons. It can be because of adaptation of the construction sequence, modification of the construction methods, or uh, change in the hypothesis of the design, revaluation of loads, or non-conformance. And all these modifications shall be assessed to make sure that uh, uh, the reinforcement margin is enough to accept the, the change and to proceed 
on site with the construction. So the management of changes on the on, on the field has to deal with multiple challenges. In my opinion, the first one and the major one is related to the fact that we have to deal with multiple sources of information. Data produced by different stakeholders, recording different derivables, has to be gathered, processed, and recorded in order to justify the design. So the mar enforcement margin assessment is just a, a single piece of such a complex uh, process, but it needs to be uh, carefully done because it provides the design substantiation it is required to prove that the change is acceptable and it saves. So there is a need for engineering the margin assessment to match to make it as much as effective as possible. And the best way to do it is to make it digital and uh, automatized. So how the digital reinforcement margin works? In uh, our approach, we combine two information. The first one is related to the, the finite element model and the reinforcement maps that gives you the required steel section that needs to be installed. And the other one is the 3D reinforcement model. The issue that we have to face with this approach is that these two information, they are uh, discretized in different ways. In fact, usually, for the modeling of the structure in the in the nuclear field, uh, shell elements are used, so we have a 2D discretization. While the the model reinforcement use volumes, the bars are volumes that uh, follow codified rebar arrangement. So we have to match these two information in the same environment in order to perform this comparison and to uh, define to determine the reinforcement margin. For this purpose, we developed a tool that is called Take Laminutes, which extracts the information from the 3D reinforcement model. It analyzes the steel section that is uh, provided in the in the 3D model, and it compare it with the available the, with the with the reinforcement maps that are uh, presented in the in a 2D representation. So the available steel section is projected in the 2D representation, but is, uh, is uh, presented in a 3D environment. The data are matched, and the, the for each reinforcement layer and the direction, the reinforcement margin is calculated as the difference between the available reinforcement section and the required one. This is done for each finite element where the structure is is uh, discretized, and the result of the margin assessment are exported into an EFC file format file that can be read by a 3D viewer. So the outcome is a representation, a 2D representation, but in a 3D environment of the reinforcement margin for each element of the structure. So we can use some uh, color scheme to identify the critical areas. It means the areas where this low, this uh, reinforcement margin is the lowest. And we can record all the information related to the required reinforcement and the available one, and also to keep trace of all the changes that can occur on site and to have a clear view on uh, the um, the evolution of the margin through the the life of the of the power plant. In this video, I show you a demonstration of how this uh, tool works. So first of all, we have to retrieve uh, the reinforcement maps, so the required steel section from the finite element model. In this example, we use uh, ANSYS as modeler and solver of the 
mechanical calculation, and we use some tools developed internally by GIS to calculate the reinforcement demand at each finite element of the of the model. We consider for this example just a portion of a, of a building of a nuclear facility. So as you can see, the warmer, the cooler, the higher the reinforcement is demand. Then the 3D reinforcement is extracted from the Tecla model and the tool is launched as a simple plugin application of Tecla. The user select the area he want to perform the analysis. So you can see all the rebars model in Tecla with different color depending on their on their diameter. And then the finite element model and the reinforcement maps that are directly uh, imported through the through the tool to be superposed with the 3D reinforcement model. The user select the area where he want to perform the analysis and the tool automatically calculate the available reinforcement in a selected area. This is matched with the required reinforcement from the 2D match of the reinforcement maps and the reinforcement margin is calculated element by element for all the reinforcement layers and direction. And then the results can be exported in a IFC file format and read by a 3D viewer. In this way, we can see for each element and for a given reinforcement layer and direction, which is the available section in the 3D model and which is the requirement. The next step is then to have a view of the of the of the reinforcement margin in the that is available in the model and to compare it with the reinforcement uh, that has been modeled in Tecla. So the user can select a specific layer of the reinforcement and have a view, a clear view of the of the margin that is uh, associated to this reinforcement layer at specific location and to clearly identify critical areas as the area uh, the, the zone where the reinforcement margins is the is the lowest. So to conclude the main improvement that we achieved with uh, this tool is is the digitalization of the of the reinforcement margin assessment. We dispose of a 3D graphical interface, which allows to assess the margin in an automatic way. So in this is more reliable and more fast than what is commonly done in the current practice, where the assessment is performed manually by comparing information coming from, from documents. And we can also perform some change tracking to have a, a clear overview of the reinforcement margin in the whole structure and keeping trace of all the modifications that can occur on site even at the different times. We have a very limited uh, human intervention so we have uh, we reduce the risk of human error and we can optimize the cost and the delay which is very important on site when you have to take fast decision. The next step is to improve uh, the tool by making an iterative assessment. So the idea is to uh, model the change in the finite element model, automatically update the 3D reinforcement model and uh, uh, assess the reinforcement margin in real time. Further application for this uh, tool would be replication studies when we have to assess the level of replication of existing design for industrialization purpose and monitoring of the construction uh, of the structure sorry even beyond the construction throughout the whole life cycle of the facility that's all for me thank you very much for your attention and i will be pleased to answer your question thank you very much Gianluca. Uh, there is one question for the moment. Uh, I remember you that you can uh, ask your question if you go to the, the Slido uh, button 
on the top of your of your screen uh, and ask and write your question. So for the moment, there is one question. Uh, I don't know if you see it, uh, Gianluca, or I, I read it. It is it is Claude, so Claude can can ask the question directly. <laughs> Yes, maybe. Thank you. So the question is the following. Uh, it's a very uh, impressive tool. You can uh, compare effectively the, the reinforcement demand to the actual uh, reinforcement. And uh, is there a risk that this methodology be used uh, early in the design stage and that we reduce the, um, the demand of reinforcement prior the, to the construction? And so that, in fa that finally there's no margin on site. You understand my question? Your, mic your microphone, maybe microphone, Gianluca. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I thank you for this remark. And uh, I see it more as a, as an opportunity rather than a, than a risk because we can uh, have a early uh, assessment or enforcement margin even before the construction and to identify the area where uh, the margin is uh, already uh, too reduced. And that, so we may identify uh, uh, early a risk that uh, change in the construction can further reduce the the margin and uh, this change will not be acceptable and we can anticipate some mitigation action for instance adding additional reinforcement in order to uh, increase the margin and uh, uh, leave the room for further changes if needed uh, during the construction. Thank you, Gianluca. I have another question for you. How customers and safety authorities react to this fully digital uh, solution? Well, uh, I think that customers, they are really interested in this uh, opportunity because they have uh, uh, finally a tool that uh, allows them to have a, um, a clear view on the margin that they have to deal with uh, and uh, this is also an opportunity for the authorities uh, to uh, to see uh, to have a quantitative outcome of the actual margin that is uh, that is available in in the in the design. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to have uh, uh, this assessment uh, because it's, it's very in current practice. This is done on a. Uh, on a case by case, and it is very difficult to track all the modification and to take into account cumulative effect of modification that that, that can occur at uh, at the same location. So for me, it's a, it will be a very um, uh, fascinating possibility for customers and authorities. I, I take the another question, which is close to the the previous one, which is. Uh, has this led to any changes in RCCM code, for example, or EDF rebar standards? With another question, which is, can rebar density actually be reduced? So the first question is about EDF standard and uh, the code. Well, this, uh, this approach is independent of, of the standards. Uh, the standard is, is for us is, is a requirement that we have to comply with. So uh, we are not challenging the standard, we are respecting the standard. And uh, uh, regarding the density, uh, uh, this tool is again an opportunity to, uh, to quantify the margin. In the case where the margin is very high, we can uh, we have the possibility to reduce the the reinforcement density, but in any case we have to respect the requirements. So the minimum reinforcement needs to be respect uh, according to what is required by the codes. Okay, there is a last question, but if you can give a short answer, is there a way to numerically show in the IFC? the values for each cell or do you need to click on each cell grid to see the values yeah it's possible to show the values for each uh, finite element for each cell uh, but the um, the visualization will be too 
dense, so uh, it's easier for the user for to select uh, the area, the critical area, to have uh, a better view of uh, of the results. Thank you, Gianluca. You're welcome. Thank you. So now maybe uh, Emil Porsche is back online, and it's if we can hear you, Emil, we could start with your presentation. Do you hear us? Uh, no. Sorry, Claude, we he got disconnected again. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. So we move then to uh, next presentation, and uh, I reintroduce uh, the the speakers. So the presentation will be proposed by Valentin Dot, Bruno Roger, and Afsa Sadaka. And just one minute. Um, so Bruno Roger is working at Tractable uh, Engineering. He's an experienced civil engineer. Uh, within Tractable Nuclear Business in Tahiti, and uh, uh, Afsa Sadaka is working for Aegis Group. Uh, she is a BIM manager and civil engineer, and uh, currently is also working in Aegis Group for the nuclear department since uh, 2019. And uh, Valentin Dot is uh, working for CETEC, his principal engineer with. 10 years of professional experience in project program team and design management of major projects. He worked uh, in the field of complex structures, nuclear structures, and high rise buildings. So, uh, dear uh, colleagues, I let you the floor for the next presentation. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. I hope everyone can see. So we're going to talk with uh, Bruno and Afsa about the different innovations we 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 had on the Hinkley Point C project for the civil works detailing. So basically, we had to link uh, our three D reinforcement model to site construction, which is very important to be more efficient on site, but also for traceability of every modification we do. So what we're going to talk about is first give you a small introduction on the context of the project, the different stakeholders and challenges of it. Then we'll explain you um, why it's important to have traceability of the modifications, uh, both for the construction, but also for safety. We'll show that we can apply this uh, approach to design replication, which is uh, very important if we want to have a fleet effect. And finally, we'll talk about why this approach is uh, a great way to act on pre-construction uh, for the site. So for the context, first of all, as you all know, uh, Hinkley Point C uh, nuclear power plant located in the south of England. Uh, it's an EPR, which consists of two different units of 1.6 gigawatts. And Ultimately, it will provide 7% of the UK electricity production. Uh, it's a huge project and a huge construction site because we had more than 6,000 workers at peak. And it's uh, really important in, uh, in today's, uh, in today's uh, environmental issues because this will provide more than 6 million homes electricity. So it's a huge project with a huge impact on both uh, the life of people in the UK, but also on the environment. In terms of stakeholders, you can see at the very bottom of this page uh, that we are a joint venture. So Aegis, CETEC and Tractable. We work all together on three different areas. First on the calculations. So we do the finite element calculations of the nuclear island. So this is the ICOSH consortium. Then on the detailing, so we produce the reinforcement and the arrangement models, as well as all the drawings of the constructions of the construction of the EPR. And finally, we are uh, site support on site, but also in back office, in order to ease the construction of this nuclear power plant. Our client is Advanced. So he's, it's uh, the responsible designer, which is working with the constructor, Bylaw. 
so 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 we have to uh, to be very collaborative with both Advance and Bylaw if you want the construction to be efficient. And our final client is uh, EDF Energy. One of the particularity of our joint venture is the fact that we are located in, in more than nine sites uh, in the world. So we have calculations which are done by uh, our three companies, so in our three different uh, offices. So it's in Gennevilliers for Tractebel, Gare de Lyon for CETEC, and, uh, AG, and for AGIS it's in Montreuil. Uh, and we also have one more in Lyon. And for the detailing, we have a main office which is in, uh, in Paris, but we also have offshore offices which are located both in Poland, Tunisia, and Romania. And in addition to that, we have a whole team for the joint venture which is located in the UK, both in Bristol and on site. So as you can see, we have to work on uh, many different projects all together, and we have to work on the same models all together. So it's a, it's a technical challenges uh, to do that. Also, in addition to these technical challenges, uh, we had to produce all together, working all together, more than 150 reinforcement models, which resulted in about 10,000 drawings, uh, which is a uh, which is a uh, mandatory for the for the construction. Uh, the reinforcement models represent about 60,000 tons of reinforcements, and all of the reinforcements are declashed, which means that all the rebars in the model are not clashing with each other, uh, which was a, a lesson learned from pre previous projects. If it's declashed, basically it will go much faster on site. Uh, in order to transition to the next section, what you can see on this slide is how we work with the uh, bylaw, so the constructor, and how we exchange data. So all along the process, uh, from the calculations to the delivery of the design, which means to the delivery of the reinforcement model and of the drawings, basically we will provide by law uh, TECLA models and IFCs, which they can use on their side with their tools in order to interpret these models and give us feedbacks. These feedbacks can be, for example, on an assembly of different rebars or cages, but it can be also a requirement of their own. This happens all along the way until the delivery, but also we can have site feedbacks. As Gianluca mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, it's very important uh, to be efficient when we have uh, questions from the site and it's important to take it into account fastly. So what we do is uh, is having a collaborative approach with all stakeholders on site and especially Bylaw in order to take into account their requests uh, in our reinforcement models, both, uh, let's say, in France, but also on site and all our offices. And I will let uh, Bruno. I explain by my colleague uh, Valentin, the continuity of the digital process is, uh, is key. And uh, in uh, 2019, when we start uh, to implement modification on site, once the design is frozen at back office uh, site, we have to find a way to uh, improve the traceability. So we add two uh, major constraints to respect uh, modifying uh, our model. The first one comes from the final client, NNB, which needs uh, to be able to demonstrate in front of a safety authority that all the modifications are correctly managed and justified. And the second one uh, came from the contractor, so Baylor in, in this case for the, the nuclear island, in order to adapt in direct live the, the procurement because uh, the modification 
of uh, the design, of course, will change the uh, the bin bar uh, bedular schedule. So to meet these two targets, we develop uh, in uh, 2019 uh, methodology where each uh, rebar impacted by a field change request called uh, FCR, uh, we duplicate the group of rebar uh, impacted by the modification. So one uh, is tagged with uh, an additional metadata deleted just for a stack of recording. And the second one, so in fact, it's a copy, is really modified and holds the rebar of this uh, new um, of this uh, new group uh, are targeted by the uh, with the the metadata added. Like that, uh, we meet the two targets. So the first one, the client is able to uh, to to. to um, uh, extract in fact the modification clicking of the a number of the FCR and Baylor is able to uh, generate the new uh, Barbadian scaling to uh, to to give uh, have, uh, the difference between the bar already on site and procured and the new one to be uh, added. So Alsa, I think you can move the next slide. So in order to um, answer and to fit the requirements coming from the client or the contractor as explained by Bruno previously, uh, we have developed a tool that uh, allows the draftman to uh, import all the data or the necessary data is linked to each modification request uh, received on site while duplicating those elements and uh, rebars and other elements in the model. So following the use of this tool, the, the result will be as follows, as you can see in the picture in the, the right side. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, one item, uh, which is the new added element as uh, presented by Bruno. And uh, the old one, which is uh, the deleted element in red. Uh, so both of them will be displayed in, in the Tecla model or in the IFC, and uh, the user can filter to see either one or the other uh, using the filters in the IFC based on those data. So just to maybe sum up before moving to, to the next slide, because it's important, the traceability process is duplicating, and based on duplicating the old elements, modifying the new elements, and then importing the correspond uh, the necessary data linked to each modification request. Uh, so this process is quite time consuming for the for, for the draftman. That's why we thought about improving our tools and then we thought about an automated process of this duplication so so that the draftman will no longer duplicate in the Tecla model and it will be up to the tool to merge the old elements with the new elements and to provide an aggregated IFC containing both and uh, so as to do that we need to work on the initial IFC that was delivered previously by the detailing team and the draftman will start the modification directly on Tecla model without any duplication. And when exporting, the tool will look for the old elements uh, linked to this new uh, elements modified. It will tag them with the corresponding data and it will merge the initial IFC with the new elements that are modified and provide a new IFC aggregated uh, that will contain both the deleted ones and the added ones. So the result will be the same as previously, but the draftman will have less work and it will be uh, much more easy for, for him to manage this modification in the Tecla model. Uh, now we can move to another topic, which is the replication, uh, the design replication of the changes on site. Uh, 
Uh, once on site, we can receive different types of modifications impacting either the unit one or the unit two of the nuclear power plants, or sometimes both. So to avoid making these modifications in several models, uh, we thought about implementing an automated replicability process. Uh, so basically, uh, this process will consist of splitting an, a model into two different models, uh, one for the unit one and the other for, for the unit two, and this will be done by a tool. And how it will be done? So we start uh, working on a first model, which is basically the all unit model delivered by the detailing team. And then the site support team will start implementing the unit one modification and also the all unit modification in this model. When the unit two starts, so the tool will be used to replicate this model in two models and to keep only the all unit models and to cancel the unit one model that are not needed for the unit two. And like this, we can we can have two different models, one for the unit one and the other for the unit two. Basically, the tool will allow the user to sort all the modifications that that were made in the model and to give the user also the choice to to choose which ones he wants to keep in the model or which ones he wants to cancel and to go back to to the previous state of of the model. I will let maybe uh, Valentin follow. Yes, so basically, once we have established the fact that we can trace uh, thanks to attributes, as Bruno explained, uh, how modifications are done and how you can find it in the model. And also, as I've explained, how we can have different models for different units. Ultimately, what, what it means, uh, if we want to simplify all of that, is that in one model, you can have all the modifications applicable to either one site or just one site. So what it means is that once you have this master model, uh, so to say, you can choose which site you want to see, so which modifications you want to see, and then thanks to this tool, you'll be able to export the model you want. This model will take into account only the modification uh, you want it to take into account. Okay, so the, on the on construction side, the exchange with the back office are uh, fundamental. And uh, since the beginning of the, con of, the, of the construction, we have already uh, developed and uh, changed some uh, minor parameter in our uh, methodology. For example, uh, in HPC, uh, it's the first of kind we start to uh, prefabricate some uh, liner uh, and uh, pool uh, element. And for example, one of the main constraints uh, we, we have to, to face at the beginning of the construction was the tolerance uh, regarding uh, the rebar and the, and the, the stud uh, include in the, in the, in the frame of the liner. So the, the tool uh, evolved uh, in order to uh, increase the tolerances from the five millimeter to the 20, uh, to the 20 millimeter in order to take into account the feedback uh, that uh, we receive on site because we have the chance on such a project to uh, have the time, let's say, uh, to uh, capitalize on the on the experience. Next slide, please. So this previous slide was to explain that our tool uh, can be uh, modulated and can evaluate during the lifetime, but it can also uh, be adapted to and uh, to exchange uh, with uh, other tool. And one of the main example is how the procurement uh, of the, the steel uh, is managed by Baylor, so the contractor, and Express, its supplier. So basically, uh, 
both the stakeholder share a database so uh, via a tool which is Harma Plus. And so, so this tool, in fact, allows them uh, to have on one side for Bailor a just on time procurement, and on the other side for Express, the supplier, uh, an optimization of the material consumption based on the uh, bar bedding schedule that are sent by the contractor. And this database, in order that the process and the procurement works correctly, needs to be filled by, to be fit, sorry, by uh, all the data that we update on a daily or weekly basis on site. And how tool, the tools that we uh, present previously, uh, follow uh, this requirement and is fully uh, adaptable and applicable with the tool used between the contractor and the supplier. And last but uh, not least, uh, I will briefly explain you how uh, this digitalization uh, is applicable uh, on site. So as you understand, we have a full uh, 3D model uh, on uh, EFC. So people on site are able, steel worker, uh, to see the 3D model in order to build uh, the, the cages. But uh, it's uh, to, to make the life easier. Uh, Baylor, I also develop a tool uh, to extract all the geometrical data, for example, all the dimension, which are which are quite complicated to assess directly on a on a tablet on site. So what they did is they re-extract via uh, SketchUp uh, some uh, basic uh, 2D uh, drawing with all the main dimension. Like that on site, combining the 3D model, which gives uh, an overview and a high level view of the model, of the arrangement of the bar, plus this additional uh, meta data, this additional data, sorry, regarding the dimension, uh, Baylor is able to uh, improve and to upgrade their, uh, that is, uh, the, the number of cages and the number of uh, ton of steel uh, assembled on site. So I will give you some uh, some uh, some figure which are quite uh, impressive and is kind of a side up to uh, 60 units of uh, cages per week, which is a really high number. So it permits uh, on site to really speed up the process. And once again, the tool develop is fully adapt with the methodology developed internally by, by the contractor. Okay, so to conclude, uh, three main, uh, four, four main uh, important uh, things to, to remind. So first of all, as we explained at the really beginning of this presentation, uh, as we are working from nine different sites and we are working uh, also at, in parallel as the constructions of, this, of, the, of the EPR, uh, basically using uh, a model sharing was uh, critical in increasing average efficiency because it means that we can work at the same time on the same model. Um, well, let's say from many different places, so we can increase the workload in order to take all requests at the same time. Second of all, um, because we developed an automated tool uh, for traceability, uh, we can be certain of how rigorous it is uh, when we will give to the to the uh, nuclear authority our model. They will be able to trace all different modifications depending on who asked for the modification, why and how, but also on which sites it happened. So in terms of safety, it's a it's a huge gain. Finally, uh, the last part was talking about uh, the replication processes and how we can use uh, a master model in order to create models applicable to different sites. So it's uh, really important because while it's applicable between unit two and unit one of Hickley point C, 
Uh, it will also be applicable if you want to use this master model on other sites, uh, but for example, we can think about size well. Uh, so if we want to keep uh, a fleet effect uh, and uh, industrialize all of uh, these processes, uh, it's, uh, it's really important to have developed these tools. Uh, and last but not least, uh, of course, all of these was possible only through continuous improvements and only because of our collaborative approach between our joint venture and also with Advance and Bylaw. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Advance and Bylaw as well, even if they couldn't be here today. Uh, it's also thanks to them that uh, we're able to show you today uh, all this improvement we've done for the past years. Thank you, Valentin, Bruno, and Arta for this uh, brilliant presentation. In fact, there were almost uh, two or three presentations in a row <laughs> in your, uh, in your uh, proposal. So uh, I, I propose a question in the, in the chat window. So uh, when I'm uh, impressed by the collaboration, the multi-site collaboration, and also uh, the multiple interactions with the constructor along the, along the lifetime of the project. So where are the difficulties or successes? Well, it's a general question, maybe you already answered in your conclusion, but. Okay, so maybe I'll start with the fact that uh, at the very beginning of the project, uh, the main challenge was to, of course, create procedures and processes that everyone would apply. We have to talk the same language, we have to apply the same processes, because if we don't, basically, uh, we won't be able to recognize uh, a reinforcement model. So I would say this was the first challenges. Maybe uh, after I want to add something about the, the model sharing challenges we had. Yes, so we are working on uh, on promises sharing Tecla uh, because we are working on a nuclear project. Um, it, we have one server now that is shared with different offshore sites, even for the ones working uh, in Poland, Romania, Bristol, etc. And uh, all the sites are working around just one model. Uh, of course, it, it requires the coordination and uh, an organization around. But uh, yes, uh, I think that the sharing itself helped us a lot because it allows to different people to work in the same time. Thank you. I see another question, more technical maybe. How was the rebar automation tool validated? Would you be able to answer to this question? Maybe I will, I will answer. So before uh, providing or making under the production a tool, we are doing a lot of tests before. And for each tool presented, we have made a test case on a dedicated building uh, in parallel with the production. So we didn't just provide the tool and change our way of working directly, but we've made a lot of tests in parallel with the production, with the dedicated team to see uh, if the tool works correctly, if we need to adapt our process around, etc. Last question. So maybe about the update of the of the global modeling which is shared between all partners so what is the update frequency of the modeling uh, daily weekly or monthly what what are the reasons of for the update i will say it's uh, around every, every hour could be could have a change uh, on, on site uh, yes the field change requests are the only ones implemented through our design uh, model so it means uh, the tecla model and uh, as uh, we work uh, in, in parallel yes it could be three four uh, per day and it's why uh, we need also to have a tool allow us to work uh, in parallel in different parts uh, of the model so yes i will say it's uh, at least daily it's minor change, but uh, it change anyway. Okay, thank you. We have to move to the next presentation. Thank you uh, all for this uh, brilliant uh, topic, very well illustrated. So uh, we now move to the next presentation about OpenBeam 
uh, with link uh, to nuclear new build. So um, the topic will be presented by Karina Lopez and Antoine David de Virville. So I will say a few words about the two speakers. So uh, Karina Lopez is a young engineer. She's uh, she um, she is working in advance and uh, in nuclear project and especially in the BIM group of advance. And she was uh, responsible for the size well C BIM process in civil engineering. And uh, now she's a BIM reference for the first generation reactors project, such as HPC, size well C and GNPP. So and Antoine David de Virville is well experienced. He has worked uh, 26 years in studies uh, about steel structure and civil engineering in a major industrial project. And uh, since uh, 2017, he has been involved as head of the BIM group in advance. And since uh, 2022, he is in charge of the group CBC, let's say, which involves uh, um, civil BIM tools and design. So it's up to you, uh, dear colleagues, for the next presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for your presence. Uh, you share my screen and start our presentation. Good. OK. This is OK. Thank you. So, uh, well, the short title for it is uh, we present you the B, the building formation modeling within advanced, specifically in the civil engineering. Um, so basically, in this presentation, I uh, will tell the, the history of where uh, where we came from in the BIM within advance, uh, our, where we are today and our goals for the new generation of nuclear power plants. But before I'd like to introduce you advance, we already um, heard some the, the name in some of the presentation, but I'd like to give you a bit more details. So uh, advance, it's composed by 80% of EDF and 20% of Ramatom. In the in organization of EDF, we are inside the Department of Engineering and New Nuclear Power, power uh, Nuclear Project, the VIPNN. And just to give you an overview of the responsibilities, if you go to the figure, uh, the orange figure in the bottom, uh, Basically, each project is led by uh, in the nuclear power plant is led by EDF. Advanced uh, in, uh, has the EPCC capability, which means the engineering, procurement, construction, and commission of the nuclear island. And the Framatom would be the boilermaker, is the integrator of safety project studies carried out in advance. Uh, these are uh, advancing figures. Uh, so I'll offer operational projects and outlook. But I'd like to, to highlight two projects in specifically. The APR2, there are uh, what we call the second generation uh, projects, where we have the full EPCC role by carrying out design, digitalization of process, and standardization of the nuclear islands. And the Hickory Point C that our colleagues, they explained before, advances to cover the nuclear islands design, the engineering and technical management of the contracts. We are also a bit involved in the commission. Uh, so just to give you a, a summary of the evolution in advance after we enter in detail, uh, we started in 2006 with the project uh, FA3, FA3, uh, for those who know, where we only had a 3D model. So that's why we only consider that we really have a prototype of the beam in, in implemented in the HPC project that was in 2012, uh, where not only we have 3D model, but you have a, a beam process. Uh, uh, thanks to the HPC and the beam process, we are able to evaluate a bit in the size of C project, which is the replication of HPC. Uh, but we still have constraint because it's still our application. So we want to uh, uh, take a step further by adopting the open beam, which is the vendor neutral file. So uh, allowing the interface uh, better with the stakeholders and also the free uh, opening in the software you want. Um, 
But then we we want to get further with the levels of beam to get more advanced. And where we come with the EPR2 project, that is a project under preparation, where we want really to pass to our integrated B. I will explain more uh, in details in the next slide, but it's important to, to, to state that it's a, it's a project where we really value the digital community and the data centric uh, process. And after we have some projects previewed that of course we will take um, benefits from what have we have advanced in EPR2. So as I as I told you before, the HPC project is the project that we consider the first one that we really had the opportunity to integrate the, the beam. So it's the project that you really take feedback from it to, to, to get better. We already have positive remarks. Uh, the beam, uh, it allows us to make, to improve the efficiency, the collaboration and the reliability of our models uh, and data. So the positive remarks that of course, we want to pass through uh, EPR2 is the declaration on complete uh, that op optimize the construction so they receive a, a ready to build model. We, we have the management of interface between stakeholders and the data trustability, because there are a lot of stakeholders involved. And also the management of interface within advance, because we have the engineer and the layout discipline. And we found that we facilitate, we are ready and facilitate the sup uh, supply and prefabrication of reinforcement. Uh, we have some recommendations that we for our lessons learned from HPC. The first one is the integration of integration of the beam process before the start of the studies. Uh, really, in the call for tender, where we are able to 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 be close to the to the decisions and in, implemented the import, importance of the beam to ensure a digital continuity between uh, the the disciplines. Also to have a workflow and associate tools adapted to each activities. Uh, ensure the interoperability between tools and file formats. And harmonization of 3D content throughout the extended enterprise. Um, that's, that's why uh, it's important for you to, for, for us to, to state to you that we have some beam objectives in the new nuclear and to where our group is, uh, is responsible, it's insert. We are actually uh, a transverse group for the civil engineering discipline. Uh, we are responsible for the development of the beam expertise within advance. Uh, all the standardization of beam process tools uh, within advance and the collabor collaboration of project stakeholders. Uh, of course, to do, to do that, we need to do a lot of analysis of use cases and needs. Uh, we work a lot of lessons and learn from uh, the previous projects. Uh, the collaboration, we are, uh, we are in strong collaboration with, uh, with the stakeholders and other entities within the GIPNN. We also provide technical support uh, for the projects that are already in, in production. So like uh, there is a continuous improvement of tools and the promotion feedback. So the promotion of BEAM, that is a new approach, in, especially in civil engineering and the nuclear power project. And we, of course, uh, we are always welcoming feedbacks from the process and tools. Uh, so the, as, as I told you before, it's really important to implement the BEAM in the early project. And why? Uh, one of the reasons is that we can, we have the general growth of the project, you can translate it, in, it to beam operational objectives related to the uh, civil engineering data and models. So for achieving these goals, we need the, the some types of management. We have the configuration management, that is basically the technical data models changing during the evolution of civil sequence. We have the quality management that is related to the planning management and the controlled act activities to maintain the quality of production uh, according to beam expectation. We have the data management that is strategy to collect, structural management and use the data integration of the with the EDF information system, and the project management uh, related to to leading the project and the team to achieve goals and deliver within a set time frame. So 
The BIM is applied throughout the whole life cycle of the project for this management and implementation of standard enterprise. Just a, a little comment for those who don't know, uh, the BIM is, is standardized by uh, ISO uh, standard. And for BIM is stand for building, I for information, and the M could be model, modeling or management, depending on uh, if it's the, the process of modeling or the process of the management of it. So uh, I talk a lot of standard enterprise, but what is standard enterprise? Uh, we want to integrate it for APR2, a standard enterprise, and an integrated BIM. It's a, a collaborative operation that guarantees consistent and synchronized data directly in the 3D model, aligned to move faster with less redesign. So as you can see in this, uh, this circle uh, figure, we have a direct interface uh, we can advance the client, or advance stakeholders, suppliers, and partners. It's all we call standard enterprise. Uh, in a, we are where we work in the same environment with a data centric approach. So we develop an integrated, coordinated, and transparent industry uh, compared to what we had uh, before standard enterprise. Is that we don't have a multitude of data sources that could lead to inconsistencies and uh, the studies of uh, of the studies and incontrustability in the site. But to have this standard enterprise and integrated beam, we have to analyze some, uh, we have some technical uh, solutions to apply. We have to have interoperability, interoperability within our discipline and the digital continuity. So in the, in my left side, we have the, the requirements in format, so it's the IFC format and the BCF manager. Uh, they are both vendor neutral files, which means they don't constrain you to a use of a specific software. The IFC format is a uh, essential already in HPC, a project deliverable, um, and the BCF uh, that of the 3D model. And the BCF manager is the format for the comments to be directly in the 3D model. So the uh, so so the uh, ask for modifications, it's really really faster than, than than without these directly comments uh, in my uh, right side we have the paperless strategy that is to construct using the 3d models directly uh, especially the ifc and it's basically to produce less drawings so we have already the models and you you can build with that uh, there is already a test case going on on hpc and that is something that we want to apply to APR2. And something that is very important, and then I, um, that is standardization of data structure and data model. Because if you want, if you want to have an integrated beam, uh, it's important that we have a standardized uh, data and model, like that they are homogeneous. So it allows the development of functional and repli replicable beam tools. Um, I will talk you a bit about the strategy of BIM PLM related to the standard enterprise. As I told you, it will be where all the stakeholders could work together in the same day, uh, model. So we have uh, we don't have we have just one source uh, of truth, uh, and this will be uh, this will be in the common data environment, the CDD. We have a short-term vision uh, for for the CDE and the PLM that is the product lifecycle management. The, in the short term, we have uh, the data validated, of course, inside the PLM, or where we have the functionalities that are data management, validation workflow, document production, and requirements management. In the long term, we will add some functionalities, which is the configuration management, the collaboration or coordination management. And on, on add to that, we have the federated model 3D view, which means uh, we have a full vision of the full uh, the whole uh, building with all the disciplines inside in just one model as really like a digital twin of the uh, the, the, the 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 power plant to be constructed. We have a data centric approach, uh, and the PLM helps to formalize the validation, exchange, and notification process. To enter a bit in detail of the part of the CDE in the next slide. You can see the digital continuity by the modeling now plan with the stakeholders working the same model. Uh, so in the CD, we have the data that are in progress where all the discipline can be uh, working together 
and with a good interface. Uh, for also the um, the for, for the also the seventy five integrated beam, it's important for for to 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 define a standard process. It's where it enters the documentation that we we have we are putting in place with in advance and with the stakeholders. They are again current with the the standard of ISO for beam. We have a beam chart with all the beam uh, goals within the GIPNN. And we have a beam execution plan inside the advance that they are appended to the contract. Uh, in the left side, you have the standard that what we call the, the requirements for exchange information. We have the project implementation plan that is related to the standardized process and the project mass information delivered that is related to the standardized data. And in the size, in the right side for the project, we have the what we call the pre beam execution plan for the stakeholders that they describe the interface between us advanced and the construction and us and the engineering. Uh, it's a standardized, um, we, it's a collaborative work with stakeholders in agreement among the stakeholders to, stakeholders to work in the same exchange format. So we have a better interface and all the deliveries to have the same quality. And finally, uh, it's a goal for PR2, the replication approach. Um, again, we intend to use the feedback of HPC. As you can see in the picture of a level in the right side, with, uh, we, in HPC, we made the analysis for the replication because we use it for as well. Of the elements, they are 100% replicate in a dark, um, dark green and not replicated, for example, in uh, orange or less replicated. And uh, with all this feedback, we are able to, to propose a standardized first kind of APR2 that will allow a much uh, easier, easier, less uh, changed replication approach. Um, so for, for that, the technology, the file format, the software, for the original design must be preserved. And that's what we will do with uh, EPR2. Uh, however, the beam process of the original unit will be different from the beam process of the replication, but the beam process of the replication will be the same within other replication, that it's the preview to, to, to happen. And why we do that is because it allows us to benefit from the economies of scale and to improve our competitiveness in the, in the market. So as conclusion, the beam uh, has a right to advance in some some years ago, and with all our continued improvement in the in the project, we we can, we, we could see uh, the better collaboration among the team uh, in, in the same inside advance in the discipline, and also with the stakeholders. We could have saving costs and resources. Uh, we have a project life life management. We have safe construction construction sites, so we can. Uh, firstly, if you, you have some uh, problems in uh, issues in the site already in the study part, and uh, of course we have a high quality project because we um, implement a lot of surveillance uh, in the in our whole process. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we will be happy to to answer your question. Thank you, Karina and Antoine, for this uh, presentation. We understand that uh, EPR2 uh, is taking taking uh, uh, advantage of the progress made on HPC, for example, and uh, as a progress map to, to reach more and more uh, digital in the, in the preparation of the project. So there are two questions in the, in the Slido um, tool. So um, could we expect having the same BIM approach for SMR projects? Can you can I answer a few answers to this, uh, to this question? What is about SMR and BIM? Is there any uh, topic under study at advance, for example? Um, the um, approach that we had for the previous years was to standardize, standardize the process and the tools. So the first studies that we have done is was not only for one project, but it was to have process and tools standardized and how to standardize the tools. So it's why we have a big and main work about the organization of the data. And um, 
what can be standardized for the project and what is specific for the project. So everything we are putting in place will be not only for Upper 2, but for all the project. So we will start with a name VP with Upper 2 and we'll have the feedback of Upper 2 and we can uh, continue with the same tools and same procedure with the uh, SMR. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had personally another question, which may be answered both by Valentin Dot or by uh, Karina. So, um, because you say about, you speak about integrated BIM. So, as far as I understand the presentations, uh, it appears to me that in HPC there is a kind of integrated BIM for the preparation of the constructions. So, maybe I don't understand uh, what is integrated BIM and what is what will be. Uh, done uh, more uh, largely than on HPC. I understand my question. Okay, I think there is two. Uh, there is first one main difference that is the digital continuity. It was uh, our first goal because actually on HPC we have one model in PNMS and we have another model in Teka for the civil work, and we have two models that have their own life separately. And in advanced side, we have to make lots of tools and management of the evolution of these two models to be sure that we have no many, not too much differences. Mm -hmm. So the first goal it was to have a, a solution with with a digital continuity. So we have with the solution of a pair two two we have the modeling in all plans, and all the modeling can be viewed in E3D, and all the stakeholders work in the same model. So like that we have a digital continuity. After for the extended enterprise, I think it works on HPC, but only in the PDMS environment for actually the mounting of the equipment. But for the civil part, we are still working. It's integrated, uh, for my understanding, inside the contract of uh, studies and with the site, with the work on site, with in the Tecla model environment. But it's not a fully extended enterprise that integrate all the disciplines. It's still an open uh, field to uh, to improve the extended enterprise concept. I understand. Thank you. So there are no. See, I see another question. Have you estimated the volume of data the system will have to manage for the IPR2 integrated beam to be sure the solution will support them without without problems? The volume of data is there. Is this a concern from for the beam approach? Yes, we we are we have quite the same volume as HPC. So for us, it's to uh, organize better the data that we had. We have a main uh, project of data organization to integrate all this data in the PLM. So. We are working on working on on this, and we are making some tests to be sure that uh, it can be supported by the uh, IT environment. Okay. I understand. It was a good question. Uh, thank you, thank you, Karina and Antoine. So we close this uh, part of the session, and we move to the next uh, topic. And I let Jean introduce the topic, if you like, Jean. Yes. So the next topic will deal about digitalization for the IPR2 construction and will show how digitalization can improve uh, the construction of the IPR2. Uh, the presentation will be done by Julien Bancarel. So Julien, uh, after six years working in the steel, uh, in the automobile industry, joined uh, Advance, so the nuclear, uh, in the nuclear sector and he's in charge of digitalization for the construction uh, of nuclear power. And uh, he will be the presenter uh, of, this, uh, of this paper. So uh, the floor is yours, Julien. Thank you, Jean. So I will share my screen. And uh, so I will be the speaker for. I'm not sure that it works.
Let me know if you see my screen. It's dark for the moment. Ah, OK. Maybe I can share if, you, if it's better. I don't know, share it. For me, it's OK. Do you, do you see my screen? No, we don't. It's completely black. Ah, yes, yes. Now it's it's good. OK. No? OK. Thank you. Sorry. So yes, thank you, Jean. So I will be the speaker for the last topic of this session. Um, I would like to present the work in progress of uh, the EPR2 project. Uh, before that, I would like to mention that the presentation was produced by in collaboration with uh, EDF. Uh, on uh, EPR2 project, we optimize uh, the design, provide digitalization of processes, and build standardization of the nuclear island. Uh, regarding this presentation, advanced missions concerns the digitalization, standardization, and uh, simplification of uh, construction processes. So today we are talking about one of our big challenge on site. It's uh, uh, how the digitalization of the processes and documentation can optimize construction. Uh, so I will try to explain in uh, 15 minutes the context, our target, and uh, some use cases about uh, construction. At the beginning uh, of this project, we had uh, at least 100 needs divided in uh, three fields of applications. Our activities are organized to, to meet three areas of needs. So the first one is um, site management, performance, and coordination. This is the cockpit of the, pro of the construction site. Uh, and to manage all data for production, we create another area for site data management. And the third one is to manage the construction on, of the site and the product. And uh, in, inside of this, uh, of this uh, section, we need to, to prepare uh, the site activities to ensure the follow-up of the construction site, uh, to realize site supervision and to ensure transfers for commissioning. Uh, for example, uh, we, are, we can drive this mission, for example, for site security, logistic, uh, surveillance of civil work and MEH erection, for example. So this is like our needs uh, during the construction. Advance and EDF create the, the uh, process approach to, to drive this, and uh, we manage the construction and uh, install installation of equipment on site with these uh, five uh, sub processes. Uh, in the organization, each process is leading by an owner and we establish a, a sequence of activity to manage uh, construction. Uh, first step, we prescribe and monitor construction uh, documentation like uh, follow up document, quality documentation, security documentation. Second step, we prepare uh, activities, so organization and management uh, site tasks, for example, like uh, life logistic management. Uh, first step is the uh, management of the construction with a risk analysis, for example. Uh, fourth step, we manage, uh, we have to, to manage um, quality, F, safety, and environment rules. Uh, so we need to, to have a stronger uh, a strong processes for that. And finally, we need to, to ensure the transfer to, commission, to commissioning. And to have all, all the documentation to start commissioning. Um, we, we will use four stages to manage the IT uh, system deployment uh, uh, and to deploy each EPR2 site. So we provide uh, uh, features on, uh, to the IT system on site. So the stage one uh, is the functionality regarding the, the, the access, the security and logistics. The stage two will cover the start of, uh, of civil work. So uh, the, uh, to, to follow the physical progress monitoring, to, to follow the quality on site deviation and so on. Uh, and the last and the, the first uh, stage is the startup of MEH. And the last uh, stage will transfer business object to the operator system with an IT interface. 
So this is the overview of our four uh, steps to to go in a system uh, to go with an IT system uh, on EPR2 site. So now this is the first use case concern a workflow um, to manage authorization. So in this platform, for example, you can create, complete, and monitor your requests. So the workflow can describe the process of uh, one uh, work request with the risk analysis, attached documents, um, and uh, a user interface. So in this first screen, you, you can see uh, 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 you can see the interface of uh, one request action, um, and you can manage also. Uh, so here is the, the risk analysis. So you have uh, all section directly uh, in your request to to complete and to add some document uh, for for your request, and uh, at the end you have the history, and you can select and you can uh, watch the the history of your request. So we need to optimize the request authorization for new nuclear plant construction, and with this uh, this approach you you can manage it. So the benefits and we, we can manage uh, also regulation process required, uh, site network management, and uh, for example, exp expiring dates within the process to be managed with this. Another use case, uh, not yet uh, decided for EPR2, but this use case show you a step-by-step -step application uh, available on, on uh, PowerPlant operating. So the name of this application is uh, EDRT, and on the on the left view uh, you can see the operating mode before the activity. Uh, the picture in the middle show you the, the the back office when we create a new task, and you can add uh, some uh, some activities, and you can select it uh, to to provide information inside. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, the history of your activity with all the people can uh, can select activities and can view uh, the, the, the history and some uh, some validation. So uh, this is a, a kind of application who can deploy uh, in a new power plant uh, construction. Another example, uh, so for, for the goal of this app is to find your way uh, when you need to go in a room, for example, and uh, you have to type your destination on the app and to watch the proposition to and, and watch in this app the proposition to, to move in the nuclear plant uh, site. Uh, so you can, uh, you can find the way uh, easily and it's uh, developed by EDF uh, R&D. And the last example uh, of this session uh, is for, for the to, to sign a document. So for all our documentation uh, during the construction, we asked for a signature or a visa. Um, some workflow need a digital visa, so we we will authenticate the work uh, controller with this visa. Of, for example, the EDF uh, supervisor or, or authorized organized supervisor. So when we need to have a solution to uh, to to sign directly on on our application. So uh, in conclusion, so at, at the beginning of the project, we had three uh, requirements about performance technical and security data management. Uh, we need to collect data uh, in real time with IoT device in mobility. Uh, it's a, a strong uh, vision for us. Uh, we, we will include all users to catch data of companies who work on site and also we, we need to have an IT system. We can be uh, integrated and modular with feature uh, which are able to to optimize uh, site management and uh, coordination and um, and 
in this uh, with these benefits, uh, we we need to have data centric vision, and we will increase with that uh, the quality. But one of our uh, prerequisites uh, is the data security, uh, so we will select and manage uh, the high value data with high, high level of quality for EDF and and, uh, and all partners to to uh, to be sure that all these data can be used for 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 all our application. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and I'm free to to answer to your question. Thank you, Julien. So uh, we have two questions for the moment. Um, it is a question not only to you, Julien, but to all speakers. Uh, looking back five years ago, uh, it is from Jean Bernard. I have the feeling that tremendous progress has been made in construction. Do you share this feeling? Have you understood? Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a good question, but um, I, I, I don't know if the question is uh, uh, regarding the 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 power plant operating or uh, an application who we use in power plant operating, or it's just only for construction. Because here, it's just um, uh, some uh, some use cases as some example. Uh, which is a uh, study for construction and not for the for EDF plant. It is construction, yeah. 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 OK. So anybody wants to answer? Another no. answer? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Valentin speaking. Uh, the answer is yes. Basically, uh, several years ago, we made uh, several bets. Uh, one of them was to go fully digital uh, and, for example, doing reinforcement models, uh, modeling all the reinforcement rebars. Uh, it, it hasn't it hadn't been done before, so it was a bet and uh, and uh, it worked uh, really well. And, and uh, I think we, we all think that uh, the fact that we did that uh, was uh, one of the success of uh, of HPC. It's not the only the only reason, but it's one of them. Uh, and I think that all of these stakeholders on these uh, projects, not only on HPC but also on many different nuclear projects, uh, all different stakeholders are consistently and continuously challenging our way of working. And uh, it uh, it worked in the past. It will work in the future, and we have to keep challenging our practice uh, continuously. So there is a following question. It is: uh, Do you consider that we can take higher commitment in nuclear program execution? Can we go further? Thanks to digitalization and. Is there a margin of progress? So I, I, I dare a, a kind of answer I, I've seen in many presentations that we are on the road of progress and with many, uh, many uh, steps forward. So, um, in fact, we already have uh, achieved goals, but there are many goals to be achieved. OK, thank you. Thank you, Claude. I have an, another question. It is about licensing and safety case. Uh, it's not many uh, addressed to, to Julien, but to the previous authors. Is there a plan to support licensing and safety case with BIM? Is conventional safety in design uh, that in UK has been driven through CDM regulation being adopted. So the first question is, is there a plan to support licensing and safety case with BIM? Well, I understand it's BIM uh, versus documents. Or data versus documents, maybe the question. Yeah. For me, Karina just talked also about higher level of BIM, and we are talking also a bit about 4D BIM. 
and the 4D beam, I think, will uh, will be very important to integrate the, the safety uh, aspect into uh, the construction and into the beam also. So I think that it's planned for the EPR2, uh, so I think it will be a part of, uh, uh, it will be one of the use cases of uh, the application of the 4D beam into EPR2, I think. Okay, thank you, Afsa. The last question, I don't know if somebody can answer to this. Is conventional safety in design uh, that in UK has been driven through CDM regulation been adopted? It's not very clear for me. Maybe someone has understood or we need more, more detail about it. it is... No. No, it's not clear. Huh? Okay. So there is no more question. So I so, thank you again, uh, Julia. Thank you. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, we are uh, we do we do not have the connection with uh, uh, the last author, uh, Mr. Leporte. So uh, unfortunately, we have uh, we have to dismiss the presentation for uh, for Mr. Leporte. So um, I would like now to conclude maybe the session. So I would like to thank many uh, all of the present the speakers for the for having uh, proposed the presentation, prepared them and served them this afternoon and participating to the discussion. So, and also I would like to thank Sven for having organized this uh, this uh, congress because it was a difficult road to, to maintain the congress despite the COVID uh, crisis and uh, the difficulty to gather people in the same hotel, let's say, or the same congress center. So. Anyhow, I see that we have been about 70, um, 70 attendees uh, uh, in, uh, in addition to the speakers this afternoon, so it's a quite a success for, for this session. I'm very happy to, to observe this. I hope you are also. And so uh, thank you. I would like to say thank you to Sven to have organized this, um, this Congress because it provides the opportunity to have a, a state of the art in, uh, in construction, in digital construction. And, and the, last, the last one we organized was this in 2018, and we can witness the progress. We can see actors uh, um, staying um, uh, very active on this road, and uh, it's positive. So maybe thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, now it's the end of the session, and uh, thank you also, Jean, for participation to this uh, session also. Thank you, Claude. Thank you to all the speakers.